Jesus is worth dancing for. Amen. Amen. And he's also worth being undignified for. Tell your neighbor, undignified. undignified. I think there's entirely too much dignity in our church today. We need a bit of lack of dignity for Jesus. Amen. Yeah, he's that kind of God. Wow. So, um, my goodness. You know, I really am so excited just to, to see what God is doing, to hear what God is saying uh, in this season. And as we are talking, I don't know if you've noticed the direction God has led this. Really, we're talking the shepherd today. Uh, the theme of our day today is about the shepherd. And the fact that we have a shepherd who looks after us. He's a shepherd who expects us to be shepherds. He's a shepherd who equips us to be shepherds. And I'm grateful to see all the shepherds in the house. I'm grateful to see all these amazing shepherds in the house. And today I want to just uh, go a little deeper with this. Because... Uh, the word of the Lord has a lot, to, it really does have a lot to say about shepherds. I mean, there's so much stuff in God's word uh, to, to say about shepherds. And so I want to talk a bit more about shepherds this afternoon. And I'm grateful that they're opening up all the flaps. I mean, we just need these flaps down, isn't it? Let me just say, I always say this in the afternoon, if you feel sleepy, do not allow the spirit of sleep to take you down. Just refuse. Stand up, walk around. If you want to just walk to the side, uh, and just stand, make a holy stand over there and just do some stretches. That's okay, I won't get offended. Uh, don't let sleep take you with because you might fall off. Then you're going to have to waste time bringing you back <laughs> like the Apostle Paul. And we have lots of stuff we need to get over. So, so stand up, to, um, go to the back if you need to, just stretch, come back, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, go up. Go up. <laughs> All right, everybody, go up. Bring down, Bring down. Build. build. That's what we're here today to, to do today. Amen. Hype says those dance moves are crazy, man. Sheesh. Yesterday was leg day in the gym. So Pastor Kara and I are just going. <laughs> oh my God. A shepherd's care. That's what we're going to be talking about. A shepherd's care. Uh, let me just say this, guys. I, I think one of the things that why are you hear me teaching all this stuff? Where am I getting all this stuff? I'm learning to listen to God a certain way, but I'm also learning to listen to movements of the Holy Spirit. In a sense, one of the discoveries I made in my life is I've been so influenced by great pastors all my life. Uh, I've had great mentors who've led me, and I'm so grateful I've stood on the shoulders of giants, which accelerated me. And that's one of the things that I, I, I've been teaching in this season. Uh, you, <laughs> the people who influence you, you become like them. Uh, you become who influences you. And I've been influenced by phenomenal, phenomenal men and women of God. A, a while back, God began to show me something unique about the people that were influencing me. They are fin by the way, with all due respect, they're some of the greatest uh, men and women of God on this planet. I have no doubt as I say this. But God began to show me something. He said, the vision that I gave Mavuno is a movement. It's, it's, a, it's to, to form a movement, a global movement of churches. And the thing he taught me is... The people you're following are not leading a global movement of churches. There's nothing wrong with them. They are phenomenal servants. I've used them and I will use them. But he said, I'm calling you to do something that the people you're following are not doing. So you need to find people who are doing what I'm asking you to do so you can learn from them. And that's when I began to ask questions about people like Bishop Doug Hayward. Uh, I, I looked at the church across the world to ask, where are there gospel movements of churches? Uh, and I realized that right now, what's, what, what's a country that's most influencing Christianity right now? Okay? That's true, but think globally. <laughs> globally, like, like the movement of Christianity right now. It's the U.S., right? That's where TBN is. That's where most Christian TV comes from. That's where the most famous pastors in the world are from. It's the U.S. And I've been influenced a lot by American pastors. Uh, the mega church movement came out of the U.S. But one of the things God began to show me is there are extremely few kingdom gospel movements in the U.S. Extremely few. Uh, in fact, one of the church experts I know told me there are only two he knows of. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this at a, at a later date. I'll, I'll save this conversation for another date. But I began to realize that the gospel, where will you find kingdom movements, global kingdom movements of churches? You mentioned one of the countries already. Nigeria, right? 
You're going to go, you, when you want to, if you look for movements of churches that are spreading across the world, you find them in Nigeria, you find them in Ghana, you find them in Korea, you find them in India, you find them in Brazil. None of them is in the Western so-called, the, the places that have been, are, are greatly influencing Christianity right now. And so God told me, ask questions about why I'm moving in those places. Because the thing you're asking to see, it's happening in those places. Now the problem with the churches in those hemispheres is that they're not writing. Or at least they're not writing information that can be easily digested by people in other parts of the world. And so it's been, it, it became a journey now of just saying, okay, because they're not writing, I have to understand, which means I have to actually start to study, become a student of movements. And when I began to study movements, I realized, oh my goodness, there are some things that these movements are teaching that they have in common. And no wonder the Lord is moving in the way he's moving. Every one of us was called to be part and to start a global movement. In the heart of every believer, every follower of Jesus Christ is the seed of a gospel movement that will impact the world. That's who Jesus was, and he said, you will do greater things than me. So the thing that we're going to be learning at Fearless Summit, because Fearless Summit is from passion to movement, is actually going to, I'm going to be sharing, and some of the people who are going to be there are going to be sharing, how do you move from having a passion to impact the world to actually impacting the world, to actually sparking a global movement? That idea God gave you, that thing that you're in charge of, that passion you have, it's not for you, it's for the world. But how do you move from just saying, I'm a fearless influencer, and hoping the world changes, to actually have a clear strategy and plan that is actually a biblical plan to change the world? Any people who believe that maybe God may want them to change the world, let me just say, show of hands, yeah. Yeah, if your neighbor's hand is not up, put it up for them. <laughs> it needs to be up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so that's why you have to be at Fearless. That's why you need to make sure your DG is at Fearless. Uh, right now, after this, actually, like they said, it's fearlesssummit.org. That, that, uh, that early bird discount only applies. I mean, it's for the family, basically. And so it's only going to be this weekend. And it's actually at, it's not even at cost. It's below cost. That's why it was, they said it's subsidized. But we wanted to make sure that every single one of us is part of this. And so that's why they said, and they even made, beyond the discount, they said, if you pay a thousand shillings. So they're just really making it like, please, just do what you can to get this discount. So I don't want you to forget, leave this place, forget. And then two weeks later, when you find out all your friends are going, and you come and say, I was at the gathering, <laughs> you missed it. You missed it. So the opportunity is today. So please make sure you do it today, uh, if you can, and just reserve, reserve your place. We are notoriously last minute, how many people signed up for the gathering yesterday? Don't put up your hands. <laughs> we are very in the last minute, uh, but we also need to change how we approach these things. I think we can plan ahead and just plan to be there, block the time, and just intentionally uh, be there. So, so please make sure you're there, because we're going to be just talking about how do we become movement leaders. So when you hear me talk about a shepherd, these are some of the things that movements talk about. Because a movement is very focused, there's clarity, there's hierarchy, but the hierarchy is not what people outside a movement think. Uh, I used to look at some of the Nigerian churches and think they're too hierarchical. There's too much power concentrated in someone's hands. That's not right. Then I realized I was missing the boat altogether. Because I actually think the mega church has a lot more power concentrated in the pastor's hands than a movement. Because in a movement, yes, there is a shepherd. And you've heard me talk about today that I am the shepherd that God has given authority over this church. But guess what happens in a movement? In a movement, every person is called to be a shepherd. So it's, there's authority, but the authority is not concentrated in one person. The authority is dispersed. And that every single person is called. And that, isn't that what Jesus did? It's like all of you go and make disciples. There's nothing about come and report to Pastor time when you're making disciples. Make your disciples. Let's make disciples together. So... Movements are very interesting because they, they might seem like they have a lot of power concentrated, but they actually have a lot of power distributed. And that's one of the things. So when we talk about the shepherd, you hear me talk about shepherds. Movements teach a lot about shepherds because they equip every single person to lead at the grassroots. Every single person is a representative of Jesus in the space they're in. Every single person is a discipler. So the shepherd's care. That's, that's my little preamble. The shepherd's care. I'm going to talk about a shepherd's care. You see, God 
has a lot to say about good shepherds in the word. There's a lot of uh, scriptures about good shepherds. But there are also a lot of scriptures about bad shepherds. Shepherds who did not understand their role, and because of that, they missed the bus, and they caused a lot of chaos. The book of Jeremiah is one of those experiences, examples. In Jeremiah 23, verse 1 to 4, God has some things to say about the shepherds of Israel. And he says in Jeremiah 23, verse 1, he says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. And he says, uh, Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you've done, declares the Lord. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I've driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture where they'll be fruitful and increase in number. And then verse 4, he says, let's read this one together. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The Lord says, these shepherds have been terrible. They've been horrible. They've caused me to judge the flock. They've caused the, the flock to be scattered. I'm going to get rid of them. I will actually discipline these shepherds. But I'm going to find good shepherds. You see, the funny thing about God is he never, he's our shepherd, yes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, isn't it? But the Lord always shepherds his people through people. So he doesn't say, I'm going to kick them out and then I'll become the shepherd of my people. He says, I'll kick them out and I'll do what? I'll give them good shepherds. So if you don't do your job, God will find another shepherd. If you don't bring up your children well, God will kick you out of the way and he'll bring someone else to disciple those children because you're not being a good shepherd. So God has a word to say against Israel's leaders who are not being faithful shepherds. There's another warning in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34, again verse 1 to 5. And he says, the word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel the prophet saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe, woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Remember we talked about this in the morning. They're only thinking about themselves. And he says, should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the cards, clothe yourself with the wool. Slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You're thinking about yourself. You're all about yourself, your job, your, your, your success, but you're not looking after my people. Verse 4, he says, You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound the injured. You have not brought back the strays or such for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. And in verse 5, then he says, So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. This was Israel's leaders. God had entrusted them his flock. He expected them to be the under shepherds, the ones who look after his people well. But these guys became about themselves. They were thinking about themselves. They were focused on looking after themselves. And so as a result, the flock got scattered. The flock was scattered. The Bible says that they neglected the sheep. And then the, the neglect is described very, very specifically in the book of Jeremiah. He says they did not strengthen the weak. They did not heal the sick. They did not bandage the injured. They did not bring back the strays. They did not search for the lost. And because of that, God's people were scattered across the winds, devoured by the enemy. You see, God is passionate about shepherds looking after sheep. He's very passionate about his people caring for those that he puts under their care. And this care is very personal. You see, in this post-COVID-19 world, the world has become very impersonal. The world we live in has become a world that is virtual and, 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 and it's, it's, one of those, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's virtual and remote. How many of you are work, working remotely? Yeah, you work virtually. Your office doesn't expect you into the office. You work remotely. And that's the way the world is structured today. Uh, we've come, the, 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 the world has become the place where you can run your company. You can order your groceries. You can <laughs> buy, read your newspaper. You can uh, monitor your investments. You can meet your friends. You can even attend church without leaving the comfort of your bed and your pajamas. Anybody here who has a Zoom suit? <laughs> huh? The guy has even a tie on. But woe unto you if you could see what's below that screen. 
you can do all these things without leaving your house. It's like the world has become such an impersonal place. And now we are moving to the metaverse. And I don't know how many of you are in touch with that news and, and, and are tracking with what these guys are planning. But basically the way they're explaining it is you will stop using the internet and you will become part of the internet. So, so basically what, what uh, Mark Zuckerberg's vision for us uh, is, and, and, and the people in the tech world, is we're going to enter into the reality of the internet. We'll become all one melded reality. Uh, and basically what, you, what that means is you put on these virtual reality goggles and now you're in a meeting with the same people. It's, it's Zoom, but it's not Zoom, because it's Zoom, but you're here. So you could actually all be here. We could actually be having this service completely as it is, and none of you is really here. But you're sitting in that chair, experiencing the wind and the heat of Hill City, uh, saying amen and seeing Pastor Ndachi, even just seeing his avatar next to you with his cologne smelling, uh, and your, your, your Oculus or whatever it is you're using is bringing the smell. And you're actually in a crowd, but you're still in your bed. That's where reality is heading. In fact, yesterday I read about an innovation by Carnegie Mellon University where they've actually figured out a way to make you, as you're wearing those virtual glasses, be able to kiss someone. Like you actually snog, you're like and, and you're feeling, because like a thing just has a way of just, it, it, and it's not even in your lips, it's on your nose. But somehow it's giving you the sensation that someone is kissing you. I mean, this is the world we're entering into, guys. And it's, it's a very interesting, some of you look very excited by that prospect. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that is the reaction I was hoping for. <laughs> so, so all these things, I mean, these things are going to be interesting because I can see they have huge advantages to them. Obviously, efficiency in speed, those of you who are in business, uh, time savings, cost effectiveness, connecting to people who are far away. I mean, there's so many advantages to this virtual reality world that we're entering into. But the kind of care that God is talking about, the kind of care that the shepherds had neglected, the strengthen the weak, heal the sick, bandage the injured, bring back the strays, these are not things that you can do remotely or virtually. They're not things that can be done through a computer. These are things that you cannot even do just through attending a service or coming to a DG meeting once a week. These are not those things. And so today I want to talk about a shepherd's care because I believe that God cares about the quality of our care. What I want us to discuss is a very personal ministry called visitation. Visitation. Now, in, in, in uh, those of you who have been coming for uh, before, when you've come for the other gatherings, we've talked about the, 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 the movement rhythms, the things movements do. Uh, we, we call them PEF. And remember what P is what? Prayer, evangelism, visitation, teaching, and healing. And we've kind of broken each of these down and we'll continue to do that. But today as I prayed about this meeting and the shepherd, I just really sense God wants me to, to, to isolate and talk about visitation. We've talked about that. In fact, I think we've talked about the other four quite a bit. And I've never really done a strong teaching on visitation. And I sense that that's the thing God wants me to do. What is visitation? Visitation is going, about, going to people's homes and workplaces in order to care for them going to where people are. It's a secret key that will transform your kingdom effectiveness. It's a very interesting thing. Why? Because it's an opportunity to practice the ministry of presence. It's an opportunity to love people from up close. See them in their context as they really are. See them on their terms. There's something really powerful that begins to happen when you interact with someone in their space. Some of us are shy and we kind of like our personal space we like our room we like entering that room we like how things are organized because the room is orderly and everything is exactly where you want it we like running home and just entering that room and being safe I can see some people smiling at me you can tell I, I can I can usually tell who they are just just looking yeah you you like that space and the whole idea of getting out of your comfort zone to go to someone else's space is just not appealing to you. Your personality doesn't... Some of you are just party animals. You're like, what? Visit? Yeah, let's do this. But, but, but not everybody's like this. There's many of us who are like, oh my gosh, I, 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 I'd rather not do that. But here, I, want, I sense that God wants us to overcome that shyness, that reservation, because it could be a major hindrance to our ability to grow the family God wants us to grow. Some of us 
uh, you, are you are assigned a group, a discipleship group by your pastor at church, and you've struggled to get that group to jail. You've struggled to get people coming. You have meetings where only one person shows up, and there's on Zoom, and that person is you. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's like it's so harsh. It's like you're there the whole hour because you're hoping someone drops in. And nobody checks in. And I'm laughing, and some of you, this is not a laughing matter. It's true. You, you felt it. Am I talking to somebody in this house? You felt that pain of just being like, I'm not called. I don't understand. It's like, I'm, these guys just don't seem to care. What is going on? I believe that the thing we're learning this afternoon will change that entirely for you. There's a, there's a dynamic that's going to shift for you when you understand the power of this thing that we're talking about, visitation. Jesus did a lot of visitation. He was a king of visitation. Actually, about 50 uh, instances of teaching or miracles in the Gospels, the four Gospels, are recorded in people's homes. Like, Jesus was a master visitor. And I mean, he visited, you remember he visited Peter at home. He visited Peter at home, and probably they were hanging around, and he's like, oh, oh, your mom is around. Oh, wow, where is she? Oh, she's in bed, she has a fever. Oh, she has. See, we just pray right now. Boom, boom, boom. She's, next thing, she's up, and she's serving the meal. I mean, he probably wouldn't have healed her if he wasn't in the house. Because clearly he found out because he was visiting the home. And then after that, he goes and visits Peter at work. So it's not just a visitation in the home. He even visits the guy in the office. And Peter's office is a boat. Because that's where the guy does all his work from. And Jesus says, wow, this is so cool. I'm going to come and visit you at work. And when he comes, people find out and they come to, they come to listen to Jesus at Peter's workplace. I wouldn't be surprised if a big part of that crowd were his colleagues and, com and competitors, other fishermen, uh, people in the industry. And so they gather, and there are so many, they're crowding, until he says to Peter, can I enter your boat? And so Peter says, okay, enter the boat. And he preaches a whole sermon, and then he tells Peter, by the way, you're a fisherman, I'm not seeing fish. <laughs> What's up? And Peter is like, what? It's a hard season. We're just, I don't know what happened to the fish. And Jesus is like, hmm, you know, I'm just sensing, eh? Why don't you push your net and put it on that side? And Peter's been born a fisherman. He grew up on the lake. He knows everything about fishing. Jesus is a carpenter's son. Guys, get this. Carpenters do not know anything about fishing. It, it just goes to, I mean, they can build a boat. That's about it. But Peter's like, okay, on the strength of what you said. And he puts it and phew, it's like his biggest, like he's been working for so long the whole year. And all of a sudden, the biggest it's like the biggest deal he's ever had in his life. It happens because his spiritual authority is there and tells him, try this. My goodness, that's visitation, isn't it? That's powerful. God reveals something to the leader, to the shepherd, and the shepherd says, you're, you're struggling so hard in your career, in this office. Have you tried this? And it's a God idea. It's a divine idea. And boom. The next thing you know, Peter, his brother Andrew, who is also his colleague. I suspect Andrew might have been there when the mother-in-law was healed, huh? But then two other guys, James and John, who are colleagues, who are also fishing. The next thing you know, they leave everything and they follow Jesus. I mean, that's the power of visitation. There's a, a spiritual transaction that takes place when you visit people where they live and where they work. Like, guys, I'm telling you this, I don't even understand it myself. Because I wasn't taught ministry this way. I think for me, when I grew up in ministry, the, 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 the stream, the tradition of ministry I was part of, the pastor had an office and people came to the pastor's office. I wasn't taught to visit. But I've just come to understand as I've been learning in these days, my goodness, there's something so powerful that happens when I, as a leader, go into the homes of the people I lead. Some crazy spiritual transaction takes place. We know Jesus visited many other people at home, including Matthew, Zacchaeus, Jairus, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And no wonder many of these became some of his most ardent disciples. The power of visitation. Now, you'll never be able to solely feed your people, solely be a good shepherd, just by meeting them in church and meeting them for DG uh, once a week. Uh, you will not be able to do it. It's just not the way it works. Visitation moves discipleship from the structure and the orderliness and the tidiness of church into the mess and untidiness of people's personal lives. You get to meet people, real people, the way they really are. It will reveal to you the, the true state of your flock. It moves you from just conversations in the spiritual realm. You know, oh, offense. Yeah, I really feel God wants me to say no to offense this week. 
you know how spiritual we get when we are together, isn't it? Then you get to a place where you're hearing a guy's neighbor blasting loud music in his apartment. You're like, okay. Are you offended by that guy? <sighs> you're like, okay. Now I know what the real issues are. It's like you're in their space now. You move away from just spiritual conversations to real conversations. And somehow, this connects you spiritually much more than those spiritual conversations you're having over here. There's just a way that it gets deep. It shows you how to pray for people. You understand where they're coming from. You see what their real issues are. It's when you visit people that you know how to care for them. It's when you visit people that you know how to care for them. Now, I want you to understand that visitation is not just a social call. It's a spiritual call. When you visit people, you're doing a spiritual work. And the idea is to leave an impartation and to leave blessing on those you visit. So it's not like buddies, like I just came to Pastor Andachi's place and I'm like, wow, nice, it's been real. I'm so glad I visited you, see you. No, 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 no. I came here for a spiritual work. In every one of those visitations, Jesus does something spiritual. And every one of those homes, he leaves something in those homes. And in the Old Testament, by the way, God also did visitation. Do you realize that? Like God was a king of visitation. He could have been sending messages. And sometimes he sends messages. He sends a dream, sends an angel. But many times God showed up. He visited in where people were. And so today I want us to just learn some of the effects of visitation, some of the things that visitation will do for you as a leader as you learn to do it. Now, I believe that God is shaping us to be good shepherds. Good shepherd skills, by the way, will help you in every part of your life. I don't believe the things we learn in church are just good for the spiritual realm only. You're going to find as you lead your people at work in the office, some of these skills will become some of your best, best resources. It's not a surprise that some of the best leaders honed their leadership skills in church. Uh, this, let me just tell you, leading God's people is the greatest leadership training you'll ever find. It's the greatest. There's no greater. Uh, some of you are bosses in your office. And like the Roman centurion, you tell people, come and they come. Go and they go. If you tell them, come and they don't come, what do you do? You fire them. It's like you're fired. So they're not coming because they love you. <laughs> Newsflash. They're coming because of fear. Because they, they better come. When you lead in the church, your pastor can't fire you. <laughs> you know, if you didn't show up today, I can't, there's nothing your pastor can do, isn't it? The fact that you're here is a testament of the fact that your pastor led you well. And you came because of love. You gave a whole Saturday away and nobody's paying you to do it. This is not the corporate world. If, you, if your boss calls you for an all-day meeting, you better be there. Because your job is at stake. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That there's a power that God, when God teaches you to lead people in, in, in your discipleship group, you can lead people anywhere. You can lead people anywhere. That's why I'm saying, if you want to be a politician and a political leader, learn how to lead in church. If you want to be a CEO and a great leader in the corporate world, learn how to lead in church. If you want to start a business and lead many people, come on somebody. Learn how to lead in church. This is the place that God will hone your leadership ability. So here are some things that visitation is going to do for you. So I hope you're taking notes, guys. This is what visitation is going to do for you uh, when you do it. Uh, and I'm going to take the lessons from the greatest shepherd of all. Uh, one is it will help you solve personal problems. Solving personal problems. Problems that cannot be solved unless you're in that person's space. Uh, God visited Adam and Eve in their address at Eden, like he often did in the cool of the day. But this time he found things were a little different from what he was used to. Genesis 3, 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Pastor Ondachi, knock, knock, knock. <gasps> you can hear sounds. And the lights are going off. <laughs> we're not home. <laughs> <laughs> we're not home they're hiding and God is like uh -uh, I know you're in there open this door and of course they open the door for God they, they, they show up but you know what God finds out because of their sin their marriage is on the rocks they're hiding from each other because they're naked and ashamed uh, they're blaming each other imagine the domestics that they were having like like they were, they were in the place where it was so bad when the pastor shows up when God shows up Adam says, it's the wife you gave me. It's this woman you, in fact, he says, it's the woman you gave me. That's a serious domestic, isn't it? From bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, woman you gave me. It's 
a serious conversation they're having. It's, it's not an easy conversation. They're blaming each other. They don't even want to see God. God walked in right on time, t- talks them through the consequences of their action, gives them hope that all is not lost, and organizes clothes for them. Like he finds a way to, he just gets them new clothes. That's what you call a visit. Sometimes you have to do that in a visit. Just find out what the need is and bring it. People don't have food. Just wait for me. Go shop and bring the food. That's visitation. And God helps solve a relational problem. Sometimes when you visit, God will show you relational issues you would never have caught in the niceness of church. Church is that beautiful place where people are like, they didn't even talk in the car, but the minute they come out, they hold hands. And they walk towards the pastor. Hi, pastor. Praise God, pastor. They're not pretending. They're just on Sunday best. You know Sunday, even this whole thing of Sunday best, it's not just clothes. It translates even on the inside. We put on our best show because we actually think that that's what God wants. But let me tell you, when you're in a visitation, there's no Sunday best. You're yourself. And you're able to see. And so what happens is then you're able to find, when you do a visit, that God will show you relational issues you'd never have caught in that Zoom call. And he will give you the wisdom to speak into them. So that's the first thing, relational issues. Number two, encouraging the discouraged. Encouraging the discouraged. Another visit that God did, he went to Abraham. So God shows up at Abraham's house uh, like he sometimes does. Genesis chapter 17 verse 1 and verse 5. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make a, my covenant between me and you will be greatly and, and will greatly increase your numbers. So God shows up, this couple they look happy, they have everything, they're rich, God has blessed them, but they don't have children. And that thing is a miserable sore spot between them. And God knows this. And so he brings a powerful word from God as an encouragement for them. You know, as you go out on visitation, expect God to give you a word of encouragement. That's what God, when, whenever I visit someone, I'm like, God, God, give me a word for this family. Surely there's something you want to say to them. Give me, give me an impression, just give me a thought, give me something that will be an encouragement, even just a prayer that I can pray for them, that will encourage them. And expect God to do it, because you're the shepherd, and he wants you to shepherd your sheep. Always seek to leave encouragement when you visit. That's one of the things I always, just always seek to leave an encouragement when you visit. A third effect of visitation, advising the stuck. Advising the stuck. Uh, So, another visit, we're we're just moving through people God visited. Another time, God shows up and visits Isaac. And uh, Genesis chapter 26 tells us there was a famine in the land uh, beside the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. And then verse 2 says, The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. There's an economic crisis and, 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 and Isaac is panicking and he's thinking, man, I need to relocate. And now he's, reco- he's relocated to the land of the Philistines and he's thinking, even here things are hard. And now his next plan is I'm going to move to Egypt. Things are better there. And it's like it's a disruption. He's so st- and he's stressed. And God tells him, hang on, relax. God can provide for you right here where you are. God gives him advice. The guy is stuck and God gives him advice. And guess what happens? Genesis chapter 26, as you go down to verse 13, it tells us what happens. In the middle of that drought, Isaac planted crops in that land. I love this verse. And the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. In other words, in, in the toughest time, the Bible says the man became rich, his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy because he followed the advice that was given. He was stuck. God shows up, gives him advice, he follows it, boom, an open door shows up. Something begins to happen. As you go out on visitation, see yourself as someone who brings godly advice and godly wisdom uh, and, 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 and give guidance. We talked about giving guidance to God's people. Listen keenly to what they're doing. Listen keenly to how they're doing it. Listen keenly to see what God is saying about what they're doing. And you will be amazed that God will actually give you a word. He'll actually give you a word that will bless people. And you'll, be, you, you'll just be so su- surprised that there's something you will say that will actually change things completely for them. Uh, remember, you're a servant of the Most High God. Huh? This, these things are caught by people because they have faith, not because they have experience in the Lord. Uh, that's why I said young people catch this thing quickly. 
because all people are still thinking of how unqualified they are, how they haven't gone to seminary, and how they don't know how to read the Bible in Hebrew yet, and one day when they have money. But young kids get it, and they're like, done. Servant of the Most High God, let's go. Remember I told you guys a story of the church that we visited in Uganda that is run by 17-year-olds and 16-year-olds. And this church is on, in revival mode. I mean, they are past 20,000 a, a while back now. And every Sunday they are still growing. And it's young people sharing the gospel. These kids do visitation like it's a joke. They go into people's houses and knock. You, knock, you open, you see a 15-year-old saying, I've, been sent, I've just come to pray for your family. 15-year-old, uh, who's in the house? Call them all. <laughs> Can you imagine a 15-year-old calling you, Geneva, just, I've just come to pray for you. Call everybody in the house here. I'm here to pray. But because of the authority they have, people believe them and they come. And then God does miracles. So, so what I'm trying to say is this thing is caught. It's, it's somebody just taking God at his word and saying, I'm going to do this. And God is able to just bring uh, change in people's lives because you showed up. Because you were there. Number four, challenging the uncommitted. Challenging the un uncommitted. God visits Jacob while he's asleep, traveling to his uncle's home. Now Jacob, at that point, he's a shifty guy. He's actually very criminal in his behavior. He's cheated people. He's actually a thug. He's on the run because of his last heist went wrong. <laughs> he, he, he robbed his brother. And now his brother wants to kill him. And so he's running away. And he, God, God visits him. In fact, that one is so dramatic. God even has a stairway, opens a stairway to heaven and has angels guarding the stairwell. I mean, it's like God wants to show this guy, I'm here. Like, like, I'm here. And when he hears what God has to say, because God tells him all these great promises of Abraham, tells him they're your promises, I'm going to look after you. Genesis 28 verse 20 says, Then Jacob made a vow when he had God, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear. Verse 21. He says, so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. Verse 22. He says, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Basically, that thug decided to become a God follower and a tither. Like just because the visit came to his house, the guy just realized, man, I'm messing up with my life. And from that point on, he was like, done. <laughs> you know what? In fact, I'm going to set up this place, Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And you're going to read about Bethel after that in the scripture all over the place. Because it becomes a sacred place. The house of God. The, the, the thug became a tither. Amen. He became, he, he became a God chaser. It made a huge difference in his life that God showed up at that point. As you go out on your visitation, remember to challenge people. It's a place where you can challenge members about their commitment. As you have the conversation, as you're in their space, there's a way you can talk about how you're struggling to be the only person on that Zoom call during DG meetings. And feeling that you need some support. And saying, I really feel you're the person to support me with this group. I mean, you can call out people. You can challenge them. You can call out their gifts. Uh, you, and you can, you can call people to be kingdom builders. You can share some of the things you're learning in these spaces. And what happens is God will take that word and their life will never be the same. This is how your group will start attending, by the way. Those of you who have struggled with attendance, it's because you haven't understood the power of visitation. It has a way, it just unlocks things. And I'm talking from experience. You're just going to be amazed what God does when you're in people's spaces. There's a loyalty it builds that just wasn't there. Number four, number five, engaging the reluctant. Engaging the reluctant. God visited Moses in the burning bush. Hey, did you ever look at all these as visitation? Like in all these cases, Jehovah doesn't send someone. He shows up himself. And he visits Moses in the burning bush. And Exodus chapter 3 verse 2 tells us, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. And then the voice of the Lord speaks. And he's like, I'm in God's presence. He realizes all of a sudden, God is here with me. He's, he's, he's in the middle of a wilderness season. Things have not gone well for 40 years. You thought that things have been hard for you. <laughs> 40 years of career stagnation. That's not good. I mean, the guy has just been stuck. In fact, he's 80 at this point. So by 80, he's already thinking, I've spent the last 40 years of my life unfruitfully and I'll probably die how I am. God shows up. The man is disillusioned. He once had a dream about rescuing God's people from slavery. Now the dream is just smoldering. There's nothing there anymore. 
But God's visit changes all that. As you go out on visitation, you're going to find opportunities to visit and encourage people who've given up. You're going to find opportunities to call out things that people thought would never happen. You're going to find opportunities to encourage backbenchers to sit up and to engage. And these are things we learn in scripture, that this is what visitation does. My goodness, if your group is struggling with backbenchers, you're the only one carrying the weight, try visitation. You'll be amazed at the change that you will see happen. Number six, sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel. In Jesus' day, if we can flip to the New Testament, tax collectors were not seen as regular sinners. They had a special category. I don't know what the equivalent would be today. Because they say, Jesus hung out with sinners and tax collectors. <laughs> it's like it would be defiling the category of sinners to put tax collectors. They, they, they had their own category. Like hell is not hot enough for these guys. There's another special part. Where, they, where the demons are fanning the flame is where they are put. Sinners and tax collectors. People didn't talk to those guys. They were that bad. They were, maybe, maybe it's like a drug pusher. I don't know. The guy who a drug peddler. Who would be the guy who fits into that category? Politician. No, 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 no. I don't think so. Kanjo. Kanjo, for those who are not from Kenya, is city council Askari, is police. Well, here's, here's my, let me just give a, 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 an aside on that. I am very hesitant to tarnish a whole industry because of the behavior of some. I know godly politicians who love Jesus, who are passionate to represent him. But our politician, yeah, Grace is here. Is Grace here? Yeah, they're here, absolutely. And unfortunately, when we say politician, someone like Grace is going to say, maybe I don't want to get into the dirty game. Can you see why politics is a dirty game? Because anybody who's a, a believer hears how people call politicians are all thugs. And as a result, they pull out of politics. And we call into being the very thing that we hate. We prophetically call into being dirty politics. So I never say politicians are dirty. I say some politicians are dirty. But praise God, there's a remnant. Yeah, some civil servants are corrupt. But praise God, there is a remnant. Some pastors are thieves. But praise God, there's a remnant. It's true. It's true. Because when you say pastors are thieves, you discourage all the good pastors. And all the pastors that result will be thieves. So, so, so yeah, so I believe that not all, not all politicians are bad, but all tax collectors are bad. <laughs> there was no redemption for tax collectors. Why? Because number one, they were colonized and then they were working for the Romans against their own people. So that was one of the reasons they are hated, is that like, they're not only collaborators, but they were helping the Romans to oppress the Jews. The taxes that the Romans were imposing on the Jews, the tax collectors were the ones who were there to enforce those taxes. And they could actually take your business away from you. They were like KRA, but like somebody else's country running your KRA. So that, you know, it's like the taxes you're paying are not even going for your own country. There are, there are worse places than where you are right now. You know, some people think the hottest hell is where I am. No, 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 no. Imagine if the taxes you're paying, none of them was doing anything. And they're all going to another country. These guys were hated. And then the worst thing is most of them were corrupt. So they not only collected for the Romans, but they collected for themselves. And so you're never going to hear about a, a poor tax collector. The Romans allowed them to put uh, their own markup. So long as they presented what the Romans needed. So when they told you these are your taxes, then they, they were actually, nobody asked them how much they should tell you. All Rome told them is this is what we expect. Now it was up to them to collect how much they wanted. So they were hated, hated, hated. Sinners and tax collectors. So guess where Jesus goes to visit? <laughs> he loved. Somehow Jesus just had this, he loved tax. I think maybe they just threw nice parties or something. I mean, Jesus just loved tax collectors. And you're going to find him in, in, he visits them. I mean, he visits a guy called Zacchaeus in the house. He's like, dude, come down. <laughs> Today we're eating supper in your house. Wow. That's, that's quite something. Quite something. It's like, if you saw Pastor M in which politician's house? <laughs> and you'd be like, he has sold out. He is gone. That is like you're not supposed to be with a guy like that, isn't it? There are some politicians, you'd be like, if, if you saw me there, you'd be like, it's finished. Mavuno Church is finished. 
That's what the Pharisees were like. It's like, it's finished. What are you doing with these guys? And then after that, he visits a guy called Matthew. Matthew was actually the guy in charge of taxes in Jesus' hometown. So this is a guy his parents had paid tax to. This was one of his, the guy he himself was paying tax to. And one day he goes and sees him in the office. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. Follow me. <laughs> follow me. He's hanging out with Matthew in the office like, follow me. Just like he did with the fishermen. And Matthew left everything and followed him. Everything. You know, this former tax collector not only just became one of the 12 disciples, but he wrote one of the, one of the gospels. One of the four gospels. Imagine the privilege that God is choosing who is going to write the story of my visit on earth. Who are the four special people? They're talking with the angels. And God is like, you guys know that tax collector? Come? And the angels are like, ah, no. Seriously, is it that we're running out of people? No, 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 no. That's the one to write the story. And it's like, boom. He visits him, and that's done. Zacchaeus, we're told, was a very rich man, isn't it? He was a rich, he wasn't even just a, Zacchaeus was just now in the worst realm because he was a rich Tax collectors. Tax collectors were rich, but Zacchaeus, the Bible says he was rich, which means he was even more rich because he was a chief tax collector. And Luke chapter 19, verse 5 to 9 tells us, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So verse 6, he came down at once, welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to the guest to be a guest of a sinner. Now you understand what's happening there. Even the, the, the social media is a buzz. This thing is trending. It's like everybody's tweeting, like the guy has sold out. It is finished. We knew all, all the time we knew there was something fishy in that Mavuno church. Uh, we, we've been telling you guys, you're just not listening. But as they're having dinner, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Wow. The man became a Jesus follower. The man became a philanthropist. He became a chief, a, a, a social justice activist. He was looking for poor people to uplift them. He started the synapse of the day. Helping small businesses. <laughs> okay, I'm making this up. It's not in the Bible. <laughs> it, it sounds good though. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he actually became, he transformed. He became a, a kingdom person, a kingdom builder, as opposed to being a thug, just because someone visited his house, just because Jesus visited. Now, of course, the greatest example of visitation comes uh, when Jesus himself comes on earth. That's like the biggest visitation there ever was. It's like God decides, let me just visit these guys, and I'm not just visiting, I'm coming to hang out. And we're told in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. God visiting us. God hanging out with us. God understanding us. God partaking in our mess. God being tempted in every way just like we are. As the book of Hebrews tells us, he enters our space. He hangs out with us. It's so powerful, it's called the incarnation. And it's one of the miracles in the scripture. Not just helping us from afar, but coming to where we are. Now, visitation closes a back door. What do I mean by this? I believe that as we invite people to join discipleship groups, as our, right now in this season, as God has called us to be very fruitful, I believe all our discipleship groups will grow. And I believe all our campuses will grow. There's a great growth coming, people. There's something powerful God is going to do. People are going to be attracted to you as they see the impartation in your life. There's just something that God is going to start doing in this season. That's the front door. People will come to you. But bringing people to, to the kingdom is just step one. Because after that, you must learn to keep them in the kingdom. Somehow you must learn to keep them in your discipleship group. They must learn to stay in your church. They must learn to stay long enough to be transformed. And visitation is the thing that provides that. It allows them to stay bonded. It allows them to become connected so that they stay long enough to be discipled, to become leaders of others. And so if it's that important, hey, let me just tell you, visitation is powerful. It really is a powerful thing. I mean, I remember we went, went with these guys to visit Pastor Milton and Pastor Sheila and uh, Pastor Ndachi's home in Western Kenya. That was our discipleship group. We had so much fun visiting families. It's such a cool thing. Uh, one of the families we went to visit, uh, we're just sitting out, hanging out, 
and the brother of that family is there, and he's such a cool guy. He had we were there, so he came and hung out with us. Uh, he's this really uh, hot shot guy. And in the middle of it, God just allows one of us to ask him, by the way, are you a believer? And the guy's like, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, why, why wouldn't you accept Christ? Why, what, what would stop you from accepting Christ right now? <laughs> Could we pray for you? Okay. And right there, the guy knelt down and we just surrounded him and prayed for him. And we left a, a man saved. A, a, a senior brother in that house gave his life to Christ just because we visited. It, it was so simple. That was like the simplest. Like, there was no preaching. He just saw how we love each other, how we laugh, how we enjoyed the time. He just felt the blessing. And the guy, he's, a, he's an older guy, and he just gave his life to Jesus, just like that. That's what visitation does. That's the power of visitation. There's just something spiritual that happens when you enter into people's spaces. So, so some tips for successful visitation. I'm just going to give you some tips for successful visitation. Um, and then we'll, we'll close this session. Tips for successful visitation. Number one, practice both routine and special circumstance visits. Practice both routine, scheduled, <laughs> and special circumstance. So what does that mean? Sometimes everybody looks happy, they look fine, they don't look like they need a visit, they look like their marriage is working, they look like their children are happy, their accounts are, are full, uh, their business is humming. Visit them anyway. <laughs> like, 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 like plan to visit your people. I love how Jesus has the confidence to tell Zacchaeus, we're eating in your house today. Just have the confidence and the authority to say, by the way, I've, I've never come to visit your house. So I'd love to come and visit. Uh, if you're with your spouse, we'll come, we'll, come with, sorry, we'll come with my spouse and visit you guys on Saturday. Are you guys around? Just do it. Those are the scheduled visits. In fact, one of the things that we want to challenge every discipleship group leader in Mavuno Church is every season, visit every member of your discipleship group. So if you've got uh, eight members in your discipleship group, every four months, make sure you go around every home and visit. And you don't have to do it alone. You can do it with some of the people. You can do it with your spouse. Just make sure that you, you go around at least once. Those are called scheduled visits. But also, there are un, uh, unscheduled visits. And those scheduled visit, unscheduled ones are the special occasions that come up like illness, bereavement, birth of a child, marital crisis, and so on. These are priorities that require quick response. When someone in your care is sick, when someone in your care is bereaved, don't send a text. Show up. Show up. By the way, you know we're not taught these things. Huh? These are things that the culture, our culture knew, but were forgotten somewhere. When somebody tells you, I just lost my mom, change. Change your plan. Drive there. Take a bus there. That evening, be there as soon as you can be there. Show up. That's your sheep. You want to be there physically. There's a ministry of presence. Uh, change your priorities and do it. Don't send a text. Be present. You know, I remember when uh, my sister passed away. And you know pastors, many times people assume pastors are, I don't know, they have, just super, they have angels who show up to help them when they're sick. Or it's like they have direct lines to heaven so they don't need care. But I remember that when my sister fell ill uh, and then passed suddenly, I was so devastated, I was shaken, I didn't even know how to think. And a couple of people, one of them is uh, one of my, my, my uh, disciples, a couple of people showed up. Uh, one of them was Pastor Sheila. I don't know if she's around. She's the one who's cooking, helping, organizing all the cooking and stuff. She's right at the back over there, Pastor Sheila. And Pastor Pauline Zhao is pa Pauline around. Uh, th these guys showed up and they took over the house. Like they showed up at my mom's house and they just asked, what are you guys eating? What's in the kitchen? And they made the meal. And for the next week, every day, they were there for lunch and dinner, cooking for people. Let me just tell you guys, like it was, it was a ministry of angels for us. Like I've never felt so comforted. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my, my culture, we come from the mountain, we're Mount Kenya people. Food is fuel, huh? So we don't, we don't even eat good food. Uh, and no, no offense, people from the mountain, we don't even know what good food is. Food is supposed to just fuel you so you make a living. You throw it all together quickly. Uh, the, the Greek name is mashakura. You know, we just, just throw it together. Um, that's just the way we are. Uh, now, Sheila comes from the, the western part of this country where food is, 
It's an occasion. It's an occasion. She came and just said, what do you guys have? She took all the potatoes, because <laughs> we like potatoes, and she took the rice and all the things, and she just, she contextualized. I don't even know how she did it. She made mashakura that tasted amazing. <laughs> like the Luya mashaku, version of mashakura. Like, let me just tell you, you know, people would come when they're mourning, and they would just ask for, you, you could see then, they know it's not good food. You go to a Kikuyu funeral, you know it's not good food. So, so, so when you ask, you can tell them, like they bring their plate and then they say, no, no, they're eating because of politeness. Huh? Those mamas, okay, yeah, no, no, it's okay, it's just. Then they go and sit, they take a few spoons and then they're like, eh, ime bakia, is there more? <laughs> <laughs> and for an entire week, these sisters just looked after me and my family. I've never told you, Pastor Sheila, bless the Lord for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. M M much of Mavuno couldn't comfort me, their pastor at that time, but you represented them. And I felt God's hand when you did that. That visitation was powerful, powerful, powerful. Guys, there's something about the ministry of presence, huh? They could have sent a text, they could have even sent money, they could have paid a chef to come and cook for us, but it's just not the same. When somebody's in grief, when somebody's in a difficult place, you're being there. You're being in that, by that hospital bed. It just says you care. It means the world to somebody. And so step up and just practice. When, when that special circumstance comes up, just prioritize it. Imagine it was your own family and just do what you'd do for your own family. Because these are my sheep. These are members of my discipleship group. Number two, plan, practice planned and unexpected visits. Planned and unexpected visits. Uh, planned visits are important. Um, because people are waiting and prepared to host you. And when you do a planned visit, they, they treat you well. I mean, uh, when, people, when you show up in people's houses and they're expecting you, they'll do their best and they'll do a good job. But unexpected visits are also nice. They're good because one, whenever I, if I, if I tell, if I tell Pasis I'm coming to a house, if I tell Wamboy and Simon I'm coming to their house, they, they'll enjoy it, but there's also pressure. But when I just show up, then it means that they're excused from pressure. If they just make me tea, I'll, I'll be okay because, I mean, I didn't tell them I was coming. Isn't it? So it also reduces pressure on people when you, when you mix in those visits. And so practice some unplanned visits. They can also be very helpful. Uh, they make people, I mean, they're just, I was passing by and I'm in the neighborhood. I bought some milk. I'm just dropping by to, stop, to, to pass it on. And that's it. Uh, practice those visits. But every visit is a spiritual visit. So whenever you visit your members, make sure before you leave, share a thought from the word and speak a prayer. And if there are people in the house, pray for them. Because it's not just a social call, it's a spiritual call. I'm equipping you to be shepherds. This is what, I, this is what you're learning. I'm equipping you to be shepherds. At Mavuno Church, we don't just equip these guys who work full-time in the church. I'm assuming every single one of you is a shepherd. And so I'm equipping you to be God's shepherds. So planned and unexpected. Unexpected visits tend to be shorter, you, there's no protocol. It's like, yeah, we're here. <laughs> we hung out and then we, like I was just passing by. And those are good. Take your spouse or someone of the same gender to the visit. That's number three. Take your spouse or someone to the, of the same gender. Doing visits in pairs is advisable. That's why Jesus sent out the 72 two by two. There's something good about that. Uh, it protects you. Um, it keeps you in a place where you have somebody with you because you never know what the devil could do. He could, he, could, he could twist around your visit to be something else. Uh, the Bible says one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. There's something also about having somebody with you when you visit in case you need support, spiritual support in that space. Uh, of course, your spouse, if they're with you, if not your spouse, then make it a person of the same gender. There's also something powerful about doing ministry. Let me just give you a warning here. If a man and a woman are doing ministry or visitation together, you will end up being attracted to each other. I don't understand how it works. It's just something you want to be aware of. So don't find Pastor M taking some other woman who's not Carol and going to visit. That is actually a recipe for disaster. So, brother, <laughs> unless you have designs on sister and you are taking her with you because you're hoping to grow your capacity to do ministry together <laughs> and sister be aware that that is what he's doing otherwise don't it just just avoid uh those mixed gender uh visitations uh it's just let's avoid the appearance of evil 
Avoid the appearance of evil. You know one of the things I keep asking myself? Have you noticed, some of you are in touch with things that happen in the church world globally. Have you noticed how many uh, in very important, very incredible, gifted men and women of God have had scandals in the last five, six years? It's shocking to me. It's shocking to me. And I keep asking myself, is it that, they're, that I'm better than them? Absolutely not. Is it that I'm walking closer to God than they are? I don't think that has anything to do with it. I just think that the Bible says the enemy walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't take a holiday. And so we must be aware ourselves as we're seeking to do ministry that there's an enemy who wants to take everything we're doing and discredit it. And that's why one of the reasons you take care as you're visiting, go same, same gender. And if you're visiting a person who's a sister and you're, a, you're the male leader of the discipleship group, take another fa- person in the group. Take another guy with you in the group and visit together. Because that way you're making sure that there's always accountability and always somebody that is there watching over you. Number four, be, be, be effective, be, be efficient in your visits. Sometimes you can actually do multiple visits in an area where possible. So if you're, especially when you're doing those spontaneous visits, it's possible to pass through three houses that are in the same estate or in the same neighborhood and leave a prayer in each one. So this is not all about scheduling everything out and, and just... You know, you can actually be efficient and uh, connect your visits. Uh, Take multiple stops, use your time effectively. I find that this is a very good uh, strategy for for us. Like you can stop by this house, spend an hour there, and then say, by the way, we want to go and see your neighbors. Sometimes you even say, let's go with you. And we go see the neighbors and we leave prayer there as well. And it's just a way of being effective and using your time, especially when you have a larger group. Number five, combine trips from church or from the office with a visit. That's another efficiency thing. I'm just giving you some tips here. Because it gets efficient when you, when you come to church, you're already out. And on Sunday afternoon, people are just home usually. And they're going to have lunch at home. So it's possible to pass through someone's house. And you'd planned it in advance. Pass through someone's house and just do your visit there. Uh, and just combine it as you're on your way home. Uh, these are just some of the ways. I'm, by the way, I'm really trying to help the introverts in the house. The extroverts know all these things <laughs> instinctively. They were born knowing these things. Uh, but for those of you who are introverts, I'm just trying to give you some. I know there are some of you who are really appreciating these tips because uh, it's those things that you normally, you, don't, you do the things that you are taught to do, isn't it? And the things that are natural. So if they are not, then you have to learn them. So uh, mix, mix those things and it helps. Uh, visit, at work or sc- uh, visit at work or school when a home visit is not possible. That's number six. Uh, when, when you're not able to do a, a, a visit someone at home because maybe they're staying with an uncle or auntie and uh, it's not really a comfortable place for them to call a visitor or maybe they're being put up by a, f- by a friend or for some reason, maybe they, they are in a place where they're, they're, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, they, they there's, there's, there's different reasons why somebody, it may, it may not just work to visit someone. But at that point, you can always plan an office visit or visit them at school. If they're a student, a, co- a college student, you can actually go and visit them in school and uh, go over lunch and just tell them, hey, I'll come on this day over lunch. Can I see, uh, will you be there? And sometimes it's even an opportunity to meet some of their friends. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to do that. Um, we've had our daughter do that. I mean, our, our, when our, our daughter went to university, she goes to downtown. And so she planned with Pastor Nash, and Pastor Nash decided he's going to do a visit for her over lunchtime. And he said, I'll bring pizza. Which college student will not stop everything for pizza? And then he said, if you have any friends who want to join you, they're also welcome. She signed up, I think it was her second year, her second week in that college. She signed up how many people? Eight people. Like, she's an extrovert. But imagine week two, and eight of her friends showed up to meet Pastor Nash in his visitation. So he didn't just visit one person, he already had a group that he could start a discipleship group with uh, in the college. So you can visit people in school, or you can visit them in their office. Uh, Sometimes just going to the office and saying, can I come over lunch? And somebody just walking you around what they do at work, there's just a way that that bonds you as well uh, when you do that. And in that place, you can pray for them to prosper. Uh, Pray over their business. I love praying for people's businesses, by the way. There's just something powerful when your business receives prayer uh, on site. And so that's a great thing. And then number seven, very important, don't overstay your welcome. (laughs) Don't overstay your welcome. This one is not for the introverts. They have the opposite risk. The extroverts, this one now is for you. Those of you who can wear down the people you're visiting, discern the right length of your visit. There's a great proverb, Proverb 25, 17. It says, (laughs) 
Proverbs 25, 17. Do you have it there? I wanted people to read it. I wanted the extroverts to read it. Uh, Proverbs 25, 17. Let me just read it for you. It says, don't visit your neighbors too often or you will wear out your welcome. <laughs> I tell my kids this once in a while. Like, you were there last week. Just give it a little space. Let them miss you, you know? So don't visit too often and don't, don't visit too long. Uh, you, can, you can sense this is a Sunday afternoon. They wanted to have a nap. Uh, they stayed up because I'm there. It's nice. But hey, uh, it was really great visiting you. But don't, also don't be afraid to be there. Because one of the things I always feel is when I'm there, I'm leaving a blessing. I come with blessings. So I'm not afraid to be there. I'm not scared. I don't want to rush. But neither do I want to stay so long that I become inconveniencing to you. And so don't overstay your welcome. And then the last thing I'll say is take something with you. As far as possible, try not to visit empty-handed. Um, it's, it's, just a, it's just good manners. Even if it's just a packet of milk, uh, take it with you. Uh, you find that people just feel honored when you, when you took the trouble to buy something. Some, some greens that I passed by, you know, whatever it is, just take it with you. If you and, but, but let me say this. Don't ever let that become an excuse. I can't afford something to take with me, so I won't visit. Because sometimes the thing that you bring is more important than the thing that you carry. Peter, I remember I talked about Peter who said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Trust me, that beggar who was begging would not have appreciated a packet of milk more than that blessing. Yeah? There are things that can live in your house that are better than milk. And so if you don't have the ability to buy the packet of milk, don't let that stop you. It's a good habit. It's great hospitality. But if you can't, go anyway. Uh, go anyway, but then leave ministry and leave prayer. Now, we've been having a chat with our pastors about reaching more people for the kingdom as, a ch as churches. Because at this point, I really feel God wants our churches to become engaged. And I wanted to just invite Pastor Milton. Sorry, I should have given you a mic. Oh, I warned you so you have a mic. He shared something with us recently about some things that they're doing in the Mashariki Network that I thought were really uh, uh, spectacular. So if you could just come up on stage, Pastor Mills. And uh, come on, let's give a big hand to Pastor Milton Jumba. <laughs> and uh, Pastor Milton, uh, for those of you who don't remember, he leads the Mashariki network of churches. So he leads Mashariki Church, but also the churches associated with Mashariki. And uh, you are telling us, Pastor Mills, that uh, we ha as we're having this conversation, because we've been having this conversation about where is the harvest, where is the low-hanging fruit that God has brought to us as a church, that God began to show you guys something. Maybe tell us in brief about that. Yeah, um... What happened was after we started this conversation about the low-hanging fruits, uh, we asked ourselves in our team, uh, what could be our long low-hanging fruits? So we listed several of them. And one of them became a very interesting consideration. One of our uh, congregants called Ben Waimani uh, runs uh, an initiative called Jukumulako. What he does is, I don't know whether Ben is here, I'd seen um, him around earlier. Uh, yeah, he's an amazing guy. Yep, there he is. Yeah, th th there is <laughs> awesome. Ben. Awesome. Uh, he, he gathers uh, kids together uh, to uh, a function on a Saturday, does grooming for him, uh, they dance, uh, kids do kids, different... What, what age of kids? Um, f uh, from as little as can make it to the grounds to about 14, 13 year olds. It's a young uh, children. Come, yeah, young and children. And they're all from all over the place, estates from, nearby. Yeah, he does them at Hamza Makadara, just near where the church is. And he gathers like 230 to 300 kids. And uh, so we- Is we this for his business or this is just something he does? Um, he's very passionate. It's a passion uh, that God for, has given him. For evangelism. Yeah. And uh, he's really driven. He's even done some of these jokumulakos, actually two of them in Bujumbura, in Mavuno Bujumbura. Yeah. And uh, 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 he also does MK activities during those gatherings. So we asked ourselves, what if we do jokumulako in the areas where the Mashariki network uh, is? If we do a jokumulako in Donholm, we do a jokumulako in Sinai, we do a jokumulako in uh, a place we call Barshosho, that is Kiambio. Uh, how would that look like? What if we assign some of our key leaders in, in those areas? It was so interesting that we discovered we could move the Mashariki congregation from the 750 people we meet within the network to 3,500 by the end of this month. Yes. I don't know if you guys heard that. So, so let me just interpret the tongues here. 
because I think what he's saying, maybe, maybe I need to slow it down a bit. What he's saying is, Ben is running this initiative for kids. Whenever he calls the kids, over 200 show up. Uh, he brings food, he brings grooming, he does different things to help them, but he has full access to them. You as a church now are coming with all your churches to start a children's ministry where you meet them weekly. Exactly, so that Ben will do the jukumulako things, the mobilization, the putting of stuff together, uh, but the discipleship arm um, will be run uh, by by, by, by Mavuno Mav kids. Mavuno and so basically what you will be doing is running your Mavuno Kids service. You'll be moving it, well, not moving it, you still have it, but you're going to have another Mavuno Kids service on Saturdays in several different places with thousands of children. Exactly. And you will use the same content and curriculum for Mavuno Kids with these kids. Exactly. And this thing is so interesting, Pastor Moridi. There is a gentleman here, I don't know whether he's here, Shamari, are you here? Uh, Shamari, uh, I thought I saw him. He, he might have walked out. Yeah, okay. I think he's around. A uh, very interesting young man. Uh, he's opened a door for uh, over 700 kids to be ministered to. Pre-COVID, uh, we started going to the school that he administrates. Um, so he's an administrator in a school. Yes. Uh, I think it's a family school. And uh, uh, we started doing mizizi with the teachers because we had thought of doing age-specific uh, discipleship for the children through the teachers. But when COVID struck, the thing died. Uh, right now, again, it's just the same thing, uh, getting into the schools, doing 8 a.m. to about uh, 9.30 uh, uh, with the kids, uh, uh, just a full church, but a different expression of it, and discipling uh, those children in their schools. And the class six and seven, that range, I, I've forgotten what they're calling it right now. Uh, that range of the children would be the ones who will be equipped to be the discipleship group leaders of the classes below them. So that it's children who are leading other children uh, with the hope of setting up the church for the future. So you're basically starting discipleship groups, not just with the congregation, but now with the leaders in the congregation, you're starting discipleship groups among all these children that you have access to. Exactly. It's like saying the frontier, the missional frontier for the Mashariki network is the children. Um, they normally say there's a 414 window. If someone is converted between the years, four years to 14 years, they stick in the faith. Um, and it's that area that we would want to take advantage of. And we believe because we are not going to be paying rent in those spaces, we're not going to be paying to mobilize those people, because we're not going to be paying to uh, uh, facilitate their coming together. Um, uh, it's church without rent, and it's thousands of, of, of people that we reach out to. Wow, wow, I think, uh, to God be the glory. So basically what I'm hearing Pastor Milton saying is by the end of this month, Mavuno Mashariki Network, God willing, will be from 750 people right now together to 3,500. That's their projection. That's their projection. So these guys at Mashariki, they're dangerous. They're dangerous people. They're growing, but it's because they're aggressively seeking to disciple uh, the low-hanging fruit around them. Actually, Pastor Moredi, like for example, uh, Drew Kemboy, I don't know whether he's here. Um, he pastors Mavuno Don Home. Right now, they are, oh, Drew is here. Uh, hey, Pastor Drew. Uh, these guys have opened up a door to minister to the kids at Don Home. In the school where in they're In the meeting. school where they're, they are. And you know how many kids are in that school? 1,800. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. All right. Are you hearing it, guys? I don't want you to miss it. There's something really powerful that Pastor Milton is saying. He's saying that their eyes are opening to see the harvest around them. That there are people waiting for us. There are people waiting us to visit, for us to go to where they are. The church has been kind of, uh, we're, we're sitting waiting for people to come to us. But now they're realizing we can actually go to where people are. Do church with them. Visit with them. In their space. In their context. We're still running Mavuno Kids. Or Mavuno Young and Fearless. But now we're running it in that institution that has given us a home. And because we're there every week, we're forming discipleship groups. We are discipling the next generation. We've just taken our Mavuno Kids Church from the maybe 10, 15, 30 kids that they were to 200. Are you beginning to understand what they're saying? 
I mean, this is crazy insane, and I love yeah, what you guys are doing. It's really crazy. One of our leaders, um, I don't know that Pastor George Hago is here. Um, uh, Pastor George he's around. Yeah, uh, he is. wrote a book that uh, is part of the things that is challenging us. Pastor George wrote a book, Church Without Walls. Church Without Walls. And um, uh, the main thrust of this book is the, the, these four corners of this tent do not define church. If every member in this congregation applies their gifts, talents, and abilities wherever they are and open it up for the kingdom of God, then the kingdom of God will expand faster than awaiting for the leadership of the church, the pastors, the paid people, and all that, uh, taking the church now to the next level. Pastor Soki uh, uh, does our young and fearless. Uh, uh, these guys uh, uh, have moved from being a church of about 70 people to over 500. Uh, 50 uh, last week. Uh, 50 last week. Yeah. Um, yeah, but by just engaging the context of their spaces. Wow, come on, let's hear it for Mashariki Church. <laughs> Guys, it, somebody's doing it. Say, someone's doing it. Someone's doing it. Some of the stuff I'm teaching may sound theoretical, but someone's doing it. It's about going where people are. I mean, your, your life group might be struggling. I mean, your discipleship group might be struggling for members and their neighbors around you who are dying for this. But somebody has to go to them and visit them and become friends and invite them. I mean, Mashariki would not have had that open door into the children if Ben Waimani had not begun the visits, gone to where the kids were, spoke to, spoken to them on their terms. And now there's enough trust that he can say, I can bring the kids. You guys do the discipleship. Uh, the visit is the beginning. It starts to bring people. You know, it's interesting. One of the thoughts that I was sharing with the pastors this week, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 to 38, it says something powerful about Jesus. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like what? Sheep without a shepherd. The, the sheep around you are harassed and helpless. Sheep without a shepherd. Even in that estate you live in, there are sheep who have no shepherd and they are harassed and helpless. Harassed and helpless. My goodness, they need a shepherd. They need a shepherd. Um, Geneva, I haven't told you this. I visited your house. Uh, you weren't around. And I had a long conversation with your watchman. <laughs> and he told me he just became a believer uh, during COVID. And he is so hungry to grow. He asked me, are you from Mavuno? I think Mavuno people visit you. Because he was like, are you, are you one of those Mavuno people? And I said, how do you know? And he said, I used to, he used to guard a Mavuno church before his company brought him to your house. And then he said, I'm growing as a Christian. And he brought me some material that he's reading. And instantly my red flags went up. I was like, oh my God, this guy is reading the wrong stuff. He needs to be doing Mizizi right now. He needs to be doing something completely. He's reading anything that he can get. The harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd. They're around us. We just need to open our eyes. Look at what Jesus says, the most powerful, powerful thing. He says, verse 37, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest. Don't ask him for harvest, because the harvest is there. He said, ask for what? Ask him to send out laborers, workers, shepherds, into the harvest field. God's people, the, lab, the harvest is there. In that office of yours, there are people who are harassed and helpless, sheep without a shepherd. Your employees, your co-workers, in your estate, there are children running around, being exposed to drugs on the holidays, harassed and helpless, sheep without a shepherd. And the prayer is never, you know, sometimes as pastors, we make this mistake of praying, God, bring the harvest. Bring the har Jesus said, that's the wrong prayer. The harvest is plentiful, wherever your church is, wherever you are right now. I remember talking to Pastor Daniel. Uh, by the way, the, the Berlin team is watching. Can we just appreciate the team from Berlin? We're so excited that you guys are on today. Uh, I remember talking to him because, you know, when you work in one of those postmodern countries, post-Christian countries, it's hard to get people into church. But, you know, we were just talking about the fact that there's still, there's still a harvest. They have refugees, immigrants, people who are not accepted in those nations. They are hungry, harassed and helpless, sheep without a shepherd. 
And we just need to open our eyes and to realize, my goodness, our church is bigger than our walls. We have much, when the church begins to understand that, as Pastor George wrote in his book, my goodness, you will be amazed that God's people will just become gathered in. Some of your neighbors are just waiting for someone to visit them, to bring God's word to them, to impart on them. And I, when I didn't know this, I missed so many opportunities. I missed so many opportunities uh, to go into a space and just when my neighbor has a problem, when my neighbor has a crisis, when my neighbor has a celebration, to just go into a space boldly and to bring God's word, to visit, to pray. Nobody, nobody refuses prayer. Uh, recently, we are, we're having dinner in a, 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 a nice little restaurant um, that's owned by an, a, a Muslim lady. And when we came into the restaurant, actually, we, we were just come, passing by and our friends called us and they saw us and they called us. So we came in. And they said, Pastor M, Pastor Carl. So the lady who's, a, they, who's they've been talking to for a while, so she's become a good friend of theirs. And she asked us, oh, your pastor's like, like is that your name or is it like your pastor's pastors? So, so we said, no, we are pastor's pastors. And she said, oh, pastors, wow, my goodness. Hey, I hope you end up praying for my business. You know how people just say it, like it's a nice thing to say. Oh my gosh, you never say that to my wife. <laughs> By the time the meal was over, she was like, please come and call all your stuff. Huh? Why? We are praying. So you asked for prayer. We are praying here. <laughs> Didn't Pastor Carol lay hands on that Muslim lady and just declare God's blessing over her business? That she will prosper. That God will just show up. Oh, I was so proud of her by the way. <laughs> it was so amazing. I mean, the lady just stood there in the middle of her business and just had a pastor pray for her. And I thought, my goodness, what a power. I mean, that's visitation in another, the next level. That's what it is. I have a good friend who does that all the time. Every time a waiter uh, comes and brings a bill, he always says, by the way, my name is uh, such and such. What's your name? And he says, oh, I, I always love to pray for the people who serve me in a restaurant. Uh, do you have any prayer requests? Anything I can be praying for you this week? And sometimes if the restaurant is not busy, he said, do you mind if we just pray right now? Would you have a seat and I'll just pray for you? And he'll pray for them right there. I mean, it's like, whoa, that's called Biazo, isn't it? It's like shameless audacity. It's just like force. Take it by force. We need to become people who visit God's sheep. The harvest is plentiful. It's always plentiful. The, labor, the problem is always the shepherds. It's always the shepherds. There are people around us that need to be reached. So that if our churches are not growing, if our discipleship groups are not growing, the problem is not the harvest. The problem is us. We're the reason those groups are not growing. The blindness of the laborers. Each of our discipleship groups has the potential to impact the people in our neighborhood. That there will be a light shining in the estate where we meet. We need to agree as a discipleship group to plan visits to them, to invite them to our discipleship group. We must be hungry. We can't just be meeting the same people that meet every week. The same number, no change. Guys, there's a problem. Shepherds having shepherds meeting. How are you shepherds? Where are the sheep? We need to invite them in. We need to be growing our group. We need to be saying, my brother, come on, we're having a meeting. It's an exciting meeting. And of course, make sure your meeting is exciting. Huh? <laughs> it's an exciting meeting. We love each other. We always pray. Come on, there's a fellowship. Come with me on, on Wednesday. And when you show up, my goodness, make it, make it happen. I mean, just pray for them. Don't be awkward because they're there. Just do the things Christians do. But pray for them. Enjoy. Let them see how you love each other. The Bible says they will know you're my disciples because of your love for one another not because of your eloquent witness. And as you do that, people will be hungry. God will give a hunger to your neighbors to want to be part of the family. And you can say, we meet here every week. Uh, please come and meet, join us Wednesday. And I tell you, chances are they'll say, okay, okay, okay. I'll see which Wednesdays I'm free. Guess what you do th that next week? You visit them. Allah, I thought you guys were with me. I was expecting people to say we visit. <laughs> you visit them. And you just say, hey, by the way, uh, can, I'm, 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 I'm Ali, are you guys home? Oh, I just want to come and visit. And you visit them. And you take some milk. And you say, oh, how was, I hope you enjoyed it. How was it? Oh, my goodness. And you say, okay, I just wanted to pray for you. Leave a prayer. Remember Wednesday. In fact, I'll come and pick you. Boom. You've changed it from I'll see which Wednesday I'm free to we're doing it this Wednesday. This is how we do it as God's people. It's not rocket science. It's the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Ask the Lord for laborers. And then somebody needs to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Lord, if no one else will do it, if no one else will save my neighborhood, 
I'm here. The Lord says in Jeremiah 23 verse 4, I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified. None will be missing, declares the Lord. This is the destiny of the people around you because your discipleship group is there. Am I speaking to somebody in the house? I want to pray for us right now. I want to pray for us right now. Lord, I just want to thank you. Let's just stand to our feet right now. Bless the Lord for everybody here. I give glory to God for the shepherds in this house. I thank you that, Lord Jesus, you're turning our hearts around and causing us to be equipped shepherds. You're giving us a hunger to serve you. Yes, Lord, I know we are hearing many things and processing many things, and it's not easy necessarily to pick it all up at once. But I thank you that, Lord Jesus, you desire strongly to see your people shepherded. There's nothing that gives you more joy. And as, Lord, the people are being equipped, your people are being equipped right now. Lord, we are assured that we have your support as we seek to be those shepherds. I want to pray right now for the shy people in the house. Any shy people in the house? Any introverts who this terrifies you? As you hear this, you're like, oh God, how? Just put your hand up right now. Father God, I thank you for these introverts. Some of them, even the way they're putting up their hand, you can see they're really introverts. <laughs> but Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for those who are boldly saying, Father, I know this is hard for me. It's going to take a lot from me. I don't know how I'm going to do this. But Lord, I thank you because compelled by the love of Christ, compelled by the love of Jesus, it is possible. And right now, what I'm praying for them, Lord, is that you will give them such a passionate love for you. You will compel them so strongly that, that, that Jesus who left his comfort in heaven and gave up all that and went down on earth and he died. He, he identified, he died, he visited us. And God, if you could go to all those lengths to just bring me to your house, surely you can help me to go out and bless others. And so I speak an uncommon boldness upon you right now in Jesus' name. I speak a, a transplant. Fear is not your portion right now in Jesus' name. I bind the spirit of fear over you right now. And I declare that you will not be driven by fear. That yes, you might feel afraid, but you will have the courage to overcome the feeling and act with boldness because of the Holy Spirit that is in you. And I declare like the disciples at the time of Pentecost, that people, you will speak and people will even be amazed that this is you. Your family members will not even recognize you because the Lord is putting boldness upon you right now. He's, he's causing you to move out of your comfort zone. He's causing you to, to be so compelled because your love for Jesus will drive you to do things that you, not, you would not commonly do. And so Lord, I thank you. Yes, it's true. You made us so beautifully diverse. You made some of us introverts. But Lord, that was not so that we can be afraid. It's so that we can be deep and reflective. And I pray that that deep depth and reflectingness that you bring, it's going to become your greatest gift. The Lord has allowed you to be a listener. The Lord has allowed you to be a caregiver. That's, that's why he's allowed you to be so introspective. The Lord has given you a deep sense of feeling. And I speak that right now the Lord is redeeming that for himself. And he will use it to bless many and bring glory to himself. I bless you, Lord, for our introverts. In Jesus' name, shine us no more. Shine us no more. I want to pray for anybody right now who's here who's not in a discipleship group. Just put your hand up right now because I want to pray for you <laughs> as you join that discipleship group. Lord, I thank you for those whose hands are up right now. And I thank you because there are several of us, maybe for reasons, other reasons, maybe the discipleship group hasn't worked out where we were. Maybe we just haven't had a chance to join one. And I thank you that, Lord, it is you who connects the lonely in families. That's what your word says. And I speak over these because your word is that the sheep need shepherds and that we walk with shepherds. I pray that none of these will become isolated Christians exposed to the devil's attack. And I pray for them good families, good discipleship groups that they will be part of. For some of you, I believe that the Lord is going to use you to start a group, even though you're not, you're not in a group. But I pray over you that the Lord will just give you the, the, the restlessness of heart to move out of a place of exposure and isolation into a place of fellowship and discipleship. And so I speak blessing over you and I pray over you that you will so enjoy that group <laughs> that by the, next, the time we come back for another gathering, that will be one of the highlights of your testimony that came out of this time. And so I bless God for you. Come on, let's just celebrate those people. Bless you, Lord.
And Lord, I just pray over all our discipleship groups. Come on, raise your hand right now and just pray over your discipleship group. Receive over your discipleship group. Lord, I pray for your discipleship groups. I pray for every group that is represented here. I pray for your people, Lord, that you would give them such love, such joy. Come on, just name, name before the Lord one thing you're trusting God for your group. Uh, just, just tell the Lord, Lord, this is what I desire. I want to see this in my group. For some of you, it's just love. You want to see love in your group. It's not been there. You want to see commitment. It's not been there. You want to see boldness in outreach. Whatever it is that you're asking the Lord for, just, just name it before the Lord right now. As a shepherd coming to the great shepherd, speak over the people around you, the people in your group. Just speak over that group. For some of you, it's fruitfulness for your group. Your group has been stagnant and you want to see fruitfulness coming in, attractiveness to people from the outside. Father, thank you for all the who are asking for things for their groups we are calling down your blessings upon the people in our groups and Lord we are praying that our groups will just be turbocharged by the Holy Spirit and that Lord you will do something that will just shake everything around us and that we will actually be a family on mission and so we bless you Lord and we thank you Lord help us to engage the ministry of visitation help us to have the boldness to go where people are and Lord, I pray that because of this message, because of the application to this word, every group represented here will grow exponentially as our friends, our siblings, our family members, our relatives, our neighbors come to Christ because of us. And so I speak blessing over you, God's people, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together, amen, amen, amen and amen.